Hi guys, welcome to the Dad Bub Show. I'm one of your hosts, Ken Blowfield, and Brenda and I, we interview dads all over the world to find out their secrets on balancing how to be a high-performing dad and a high-performer in life too. So without further ado, let's get into the show. John, welcome to the show. This is the Dad Bub Show. John is a pastor and an evidence-based parenting educator, right? Practitioner as well. He's living in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. So if anyone knows of Chicago, they do an amazing, I think it's an Italian beef or Italian uh, roll. They're, they're famous for it. It's like one of the best sandwiches in the world, so I hear. Uh, so he lives in Chicago with his with his wife, Jess, and their family. He's got three boys now, which is amazing. And he first got interested in holistic evidence-based parenting whilst working towards his master's degree and taking courses in counseling. At first, it was confined to his own research for his own children and his own newborn, uh, but soon he was providing coaching and educating to friends and family as well in his professional capacities as a chaplain and pastor. He eventually took his resources and messages onto TikTok, where he grew his account from zero to, zero to over 200,000 followers in just two months. John, now a father of three boys, is working to expand resources for parents and especially dads of children of all ages and is, and is in the process of building a comprehensive evidence-based parenting course. So, John, welcome to the show. You know this, is, this guy is going to be amazing and drop some bombs because this is exactly what we, we're all about, like helping dads become better parents. And we've got the man, the expert, the legend, Mr. John Fogel. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Thank you. John, welcome. The floor is yours. Yeah, no, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, super excited to continue to share this message, to take this um, shout out from the rooftops. Uh, this is something that I really care about for a lot of reasons. I think that, you know, um, I'm a pastor by trade. And so uh, trying to kind of you know, do the best that we can with the world is, is a big piece of my kind of vision for for what I'm trying to do in life. And I think that the, the, the greatest impact that any of us have is on our kids. Um, the greatest impact that any of us have realistically on the world is through our kids. You know, very few people are going to become the, the, the president or the prime minister or something like this um, or, or the CEO of a company that, you know, makes a quadrillion billion dollars a year or something. Um, but all of us will, many of us will have kids and, you know, for us, this is the single greatest thing. It's, it's the greatest responsibility. It's the greatest challenge and it's the greatest impact that any of us can have. So, uh, just super excited to be on and, and talk chat. Man, so good. So I got to open up with the first question. Either Chicago is the city of the fountain of youth or you just have the biggest baby face of all time. I've got to ask, how old are you? I am 30. So I am 30 years old. Okay. Yeah. And three boys? How old are the three boys? Sorry, that's where I was getting to with this. I was oh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. three no, boys, how do you it, look like that? Just, so, so, I was, so, so there was a time when I was the, the youngest lead pastor in my denomination. So, so I am pretty young. Um, but, but yeah, so I have three boys ages uh, just about to be six next week. Um, and, and that he's the oldest, and then I have one that's two and one that's eight months. That's so cool. And so for you, being a dad and having three, I've got one, Ken's got one. Um, for me, anyone who has two, I'm like, okay. Anyone who has three, I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. My sister's got four and I still can't like, you know, uh, it's a lot of work. So I take my hat off for you guys for sure. So having three boys and you're obviously very passionate about, um, you know, this subject, very educated and coming from a church where you get to work with a lot of families, which, uh, I know would be amazingly important too. Did you always want to be a dad? Like, was that the thing that was like so super exciting for you? Um, yeah, you know, at different points along the journey, um, you know, I kind of with the birth of all three of our kids, um, it, they weren't like big surprises in our relationship, but but certainly like, wow, that for for us we were very blessed that, that happened very quickly. So so it was like it was like month one, like like okay, we're doing it, like we're like when we've made this decision, it's going to happen. So did I feel ready? No, like not at all. Uh, never, never. Even with the third one, I, you know, I I don't, I still don't feel ready. We're eight months in, um, <laughs> but. Uh, I did know that it was something that I, I came from a family of three where I was one of, I was one of three boys as well as the youngest. 
So, so I knew that we wanted to, have, we both knew that we wanted to have kids. We're probably going to wind up having more kids than three. Um, <laughs> so, so, so we, we, we like the idea of a big family um, and just kind of the relationships that, that can come through that. Um, a lot of religious people have, have, ideas of having a lot of big family. We're, we're not like that. It's not like because of our faith structure that we want to have this gigantic. <laughs> it's just like something that me and my wife also just like want to do. But usually when people hear that, they're like, oh, you're one of those. Um, yeah. No, no, yeah, this no, must no. be a church thing, right? <laughs> this is a church thing. Like, oh, you're trying to like make a bunch of missionaries to go out in the world. Like, no, 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 that's not <laughs> No, not us at all. But but we do, you know, we love being parents and we love the interactions, especially between our kids and, and, and coming to see that. That's not always been easy, obviously. Um, that's a challenge. Sibling relationships are challenging. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I always knew I wanted to be a dad, but um, I, you know, what's really interesting to me is I, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a dad of like a seven-year-old or older. I didn't know if I wanted to be a dad of a kid until the age of seven. I, I wasn't sure. And now that, I've, <laughs> now that I've three under seven, I'm like, oh, come on. This is like the best part. And I'm sure I'll say that. That's such an interesting concept. I've never heard someone put it like that. Yeah, I always wanted to be a dad, but just wait until they're seven years old. Like this, We all have the picture, right? We all have the picture of like when you're like, okay, what's it going to be like to be a dad? Like you don't think to yourself like, well, maybe you do, but I didn't think to myself like holding a baby. I thought to myself like playing catch, like – like coaching a soccer team or something. And like those things don't happen when they're like three years old, unless you're a crazy person. I'll give you some context into that. Sorry, Ken, I know you're going to jump in. Like everyone, so we interview like so many dads and everything is so different. So you said like this picture of playing catch and doing that stuff. It was weird because I didn't have a picture at all. I spent so much of my 20s, especially just like self-focused, um, you know, very like business uh, oriented we didn't have a baby till we were 35 and it was weird to even have an image in my head at that time that I would have a child. It's like something that I had not even put out there until it was there. But then when it happened, it was just like so naturally of, oh yeah, like, you know, I got this and uh, it's been an awesome journey. So you, you say there, right, in terms of, um, I, I, it's funny that you kind of talk to, talk to you about that that idea of being the, the ideal dad or the perfect dad and, and what that kind of picture looked like to you. I remember being a being an uncle. I'm, I'm obviously still an uncle. Um, but the when my when my sister-in-law had kids, it's like, until they were four, I was like, I'm just not interested. Not interested in the baby phase. It's it's boring. The goo goo gaga, just not interested. When they were four, it's like they're tormenting, they're running, they're breaking, they're damaging. I was I'm just a big kid, so I just like let's get around this. I was like let's break things, let's wrestle, let's throw things, let's go and, and um I like feed them with full of sugar, then give them back to the parents, and I, I get a lot of joy out of that. And um so but you know and, and, but it's so it's so fun experiencing that growth period of like you know four. Now we've got one that's that, my nephew. He's almost twelve. And that that growth period through that that phase is so exciting because you get to do all the things that you picture as like in my opinion I think I've got a similar mindset as you of you as like what you do as a dad like the the adolescent age I'm not really interested in at this present point in time because I I still kind of I don't know why but I still kind of feel like I'm I'm still an adolescent and I know he's gonna go through all those tormenting um, terrible times that we all go through where we challenge authority challenge society and I'm just like. I just don't want to deal with that. That's your parents' problem now. But I like I really enjoyed that fun period of time in your life where you were just a young kid and I can impact you with, with throwing balls and, and, and playing sports and all those types of things. But John, I want to take a switch, right? Because um, I know uh, where you kind of specialize in is like authoritative, authoritative parenting and obviously effective discipline and obviously working smarter, not harder and all those types of things. So that's, that's an interesting... Um, I suppose, direction to go down. So what is authoritative parenting and how does that work? Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big, not like no labels guy. So, so I can explain to you what authoritative parenting is or conscious parenting. The truth is like all of these labels are, are really trying to get at a, a core principle of being child, like guided by being high. Uh, it's, it's called like high attachment or high connection and high expectation. So that's authoritative parenting in, in a, in a, you know, in a nutshell. So if you, most, most kids growing up uh, who are raised, especially in the, you know, eighties and, and, and on back and even in the early nineties, 
um, what you what we experienced mostly was what was kind of the the talk of the day was authoritarian parenting, which is like, hey, you know, don't don't engage the tantrum. If you, if your kid's melting down, you walk away. You know, put a pillow under their head and let them scream. Like, don't you know? They're just looking for attention. They're trying to manipulate you. So this is a very low connection type of parenting. And it, it, it can be effective in, in, in some ways. It can be effective at correcting behavior, but it's usually not as effective, like, like you said, working smarter, not harder. It's not as effective at actually teaching the core tenet of what you're trying to get at. Um, so you have high expectations. Hey, we, we expect this kind of behaviors, these kind of interactions, but, but low connection. The, the, the reverse of that is having no expectations and high connection. And this is like the typical, these parents are actually very, very rare, but it's like the parent who just gives in to every single thing and never has any, you know, uh, no interest in discipline, short term, short, short term minded, you know, I'm just going to pump them full of sugar all the time. And, and like, really, these parents are very rare. I think all of us especially in the in, in like the western mindset when we think about parenting a lot of us are really afraid of that and so we are afraid all the time that we're doing that um but that's actually incredibly rare it, when, when you come across that it's like i'm always shocked most parents think they're too permissive and 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 really they're just not being mean and they're like i think i'm supposed to be being mean here i i, I feel like i'm not mean enough um, so authoritarian parenting is this kind of, okay, well, I'm going to have high expectations, right? I'm not going to be permissive, but I'm also going to have a high level of connection. So I'm going to like, I'm not just going to leave you on your own to navigate your way through emotions. I'm going to go into those emotions and co-regulate with you. And there's a lot of really great neuropsychology on why this is kind of the ideal parenting style. But the reason that I don't like labels is because I still feel like it bends itself towards the, like, again, trying to reject this idea that you, your kids should lead you. Like the truth is our kids really in many ways should be leading our parenting. We might know what's best for, you know, a, being an adult, but, but getting them there, they have to be on board with that process. Any employer knows this. Like we would never treat our employees the way that we treat our kids. And if we do, if we're just domineering and just tell them, no, this is how you have to do it. And you can't change this. And you, we don't, I don't want your input in this process what is your employee going to do? They're going to leave, right? So your kid doesn't have that opportunity, that option of leaving. So they just check out emotionally. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the employees leave and burn the company down when they when they do so, when they leave right. out the door because they had such a bad experience. I guess your kids quite a can too in the future is if you're having those parenting. I'm sure there's a lot of attachments that come with that as well. Well, and it's true. I mean, parents always ask me like, well, how do like, especially in a pastoral environment now, when I talk to adult you know, people, especially in older in their 50s, 60s, who are like, how do I connect with my adult children? I'm like, we can do a lot to try and connect with your adult children. We can do a lot of repair. I, I believe in this stuff. I think that we can repair relationships at any age. Um, that said, the way to connect with your adult children is to connect with them when they're not adults. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, you build those, those strong, deep connections and trust relationships early on and those will follow you into adulthood you try and go back and rework that later because you were absent as a as a as a caregiver you're you're gonna have a hard time and and just based on the structure of our lives that's really hard for us because usually what coincides is when you have kids is when the when your work is demanding the most out of you and so that's a really hard balance to know hey I am setting myself up for a future in whatever industry or as an entrepreneur or whatever, but I also have to realize that I'm setting up a lifetime with a child who, who yes, I have, you know, maybe 17, 18, most of the time, more like 14 or 15 years before they're really pretty autonomous. I'm going to have this time with them. And then at that point, they're going to be off and they're going to be able to make the call whether they want to connect with me or not. Yeah. I really, I really like that because, um, uh, that that's really kind of why we founded this podcast, right? It's like how to balance the dichotomy of being a high performer in life uh, and a high performing dad as well. And so, if you're a high performer in life, whether that be in business, could be in sp like extreme sports, it could be whatever. It's like a lot of times, if you let that define you, it can take you away from your family completely, and you could just be present with your child ten minutes a day, 
eat less than that sometimes. That you know, sometimes an hour a week for some dads. Um, so, uh, and I'm not say, speaking um, dads independently. This can be females and women and mums as well. It's just that obviously, in the case of this podcast, it's the dad bub show. So for dads specifically. And so we want to kind of understand how can dads, you know, be a an an all encompass all encompassing amazing father whilst he's there and present every single day or as much as he possibly can, whilst also creating an amazing life for him and his family as well. And that's really kind of I think the beauty of speaking to people like yourselves. It's like because you speak to people like this all the time, you're doing this yourself. It's like you could let TikTok com- com- t- completely absorb your life because you've got a massive following there, and you could just let all of your education, all the experiences that you have and spend all your time creating all this amazing content and then completely disregard your three boys. Of course, it would go against your teachings, but of course you could. And there would be opportunity for you to make a lot of money by doing so. So like maybe that's just a, a direct question I can just ask you right now. It's like, how do you structure your day? Yeah, so, you know, he, so I'm still learning, to be honest. Um, like the, 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 the truth is uh, every, I say this, it's funny, I'm starting to say this in my parenting with my parenting hat on as much as I'm saying this with my preaching hat on. But when I, when I preach, a lot of times I'll say to people, Hey, the first person that this sermon is for is me. Like anything that I'm saying to you is something that I need to hear. Um, the same is true with my TikTok videos. Anything that I'm putting out there is something that in that moment, the reason I thought of that thing most likely is because I found myself struggling to do that thing. Or I saw somebody else in my presence struggling to do that thing. So you watch me so much of, so many of my videos are recorded at the park because I've watched a parent do something that I go, Oh, I I should address that with my TikTok people. And also my kids are the park for me. This is a side note. Uh, Your kids should have a lot of places where they can be totally autonomous and Mm -hmm. be free to be them a hundred percent and you not get involved. Um, Any place that you can do that in life do that um so like that for me the park is that place so so it's but but you're right i mean this is this is a struggle for me and how do i structure my day is one it's day to day so so planning around the things that i have to do and then the things that i probably should be doing and then the things that i want to do um and then and then keeping a very real uh an honest check on what type of time i'm spending with my kids so there's, there's many different types of time that we can spend with our kids. There's time where we're distracted, but we're with our kids. Well, you know, is that really the best use of your time to be divided? I mean, all of us know this, right? You can, you can have a YouTube video on in the background and something else and three or four things and then be trying to work on a project. You're not going to be very productive. Same thing is true with your relationships. So when I'm with my kids, being conscious of like, hey, can I leave my phone in the other room? But can I just not have it with me so that I'm not distracted by it? Um, you know, during certain hours of the day, I know my kids are more independent and certain hours of the day, they need me more to, to co-regulate with them and get them through towards the end of the day, five, six o'clock at night, they start to melt down. These are the times when, you know, I need to know, hey, I'm not gonna make any TikTok videos. And I probably should not be planning things. The other thing is that knowing your kids' needs and then structuring your business life around them if you can. So I I have a job where I can make my own hours, both in TikTok and and social media and as a pastor. Um, I don't take any meetings between 11.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., which is the middle, you know, lunchtime. That's, that's, That's a time when everybody wants to meet. But I know because of nap schedules with three kids, that's a time when we've committed to, I just need to be present with my kids. My phone goes off or it goes on do not disturb mode. I'm just present with my kids for that hour. And that's just consistent every day. When somebody says, can you please meet at this time? I say, I can meet five minutes after that time is over. I can meet up to five minutes until that time, but I cannot meet during that hour. And that you lose out on deals. You lose out on opportunities. Don't do this with nine hours a day. But if you have to structure, hey, I can't do it at this time or I have to be there for bedtime every night. Once you set that as an expectation for yourself, live by that expectation. And it models it for your kids. They learn, hey, if I have a priority, like if there's a priority in my life that I truly deeply care about, like I should not surrender or sacrifice that thing so that I can make these moves, you know? 
Um, and that's just good work-life balance and, and health and parenting and all of that. So you've got three boys. So And obviously, every child, I can assume, unless you've got cookie-cutter carbon copy boys, but I'm assuming every single one of the boys was completely different. So what did you find um, going through the teachings? And obviously, once eight months, um, so probably a little bit early on that stage. But with the other two especially, the different approaches to your teaching, and obviously one of them would have been the second time around, um, and I'm sure there was a little bit more know-how there, but how did you find um, that process applying some of the things that you teach now um, to those boys as they were growing up? Yeah, so so the truth is most kids are not, obviously no kids are cookie cutter, right? But you know, three quarters of kids or maybe 80% of kids are kind of within this normal emotional realm of, you know, they, every kid has tantrums, every kid melts down, but, but even beyond what we you know, talk about neurodiversity and, and autism and, and, and disorders or, or, or differences, neuro, diff, neurological differences, you also have a subcategory that's becoming more and more popular. Uh, if you, there's a, a documentary out on Netflix or on uh, Amazon prime about it, um, called high sensitivity. And so this top 20% or, or not tw- top, but there's 20% of the population for whom everything can be emotional. Everything is, is can be a meltdown. Um, and there, there's this brilliant psychologist, Elaine Aaron, who, who has written extensively about this. I only learned about this recently, but, but I've, my, my oldest is one of these. So my oldest is one of, uh, is, is just when everybody else was having an easy time, every single thing for us was, was a challenge. So for people ask me all the time, like, I just don't feel like I have to use all these techniques all the time to get my kid through a tantrum and they're just kind of get over it. I'm like, yeah, well, you don't have a highly sensitive kid. So, so coming from that and learning and building these skills with him, like this was not an easy transition. This was a challenge and still is. He's six. We, we, we have to do like birthday parties have to be different. We can't open presents at the birthday party because like, that's just something that's He's just like super stressed about like, what if I open it and my face doesn't do the right thing and then people hate me like at five years old, right? Like yeah, wow. he understands subtle nuances between people. So understanding that now with my, my second one, who's not nearly that sensitive and, and much kind of more mainstream in that way, I feel like I'm just like a, a rock star most of the time because, because like I'm pulling out these things and I'm like, oh man, I got I got to like set myself up for all these things and, and I can do all this smarter, not harder, not just authoritative, but, you know, co-regulation and connecting and redirecting and all of these things that I talk about. And, and I can do that stuff with this two year old. And, and it's just like, he's just like, Oh, this is, this is great. You know, and I can just respond. So, so that's been the, the change for me is that I started really tough. A lot of people will have a highly sensitive kid second or third. And that's so hard because you like, it was like not that hard for like the first one or the first two. And then they have a kid and they're just like, nothing works. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's, that is how it feels. They just have a whole different set of emotional needs. So, so that's, that was the process for me, but also just not having as many hands. is just hard. I don't know that I could have done my highly sensitive child was my third one and been successful in the same ways. Cause I just didn't have the hands. I mean, it's just hard. It's different, right? Because you've got to balance the rest, you know, the, the other children as well and all those types of things. So I, <clears throat> I'm curious about that. I just want to touch on that uh, really quickly because obviously having a highly sensitive child, you know, or, or a more sensitive child, you know, and them understanding the nuances of, you know, emotional expression and how, how people um, feel about them and the opinions that people have about them and obviously, obviously all, all those types of things, that can obviously make you very self-conscious. But obviously it, it can also, if you... If you uh, move into that, if you ease into that, right, and use that as a strength, it must give you a lot of um, ability to use that as a as a uh, as something that you you can take into the real world. It's like I understand people better than most. I understand emotions better than most, right? Right. So, so this is right. So so if you look at you know, so I, you'd have to read her book, The Highly Sensitive Person, which isn't about parenting; it's about um, adults who who have high sensitivity. But but if you look at some of the great kind of emotional poets, artists. Elena Morissette is the one in the documentary. But but if you look at some of these, and, and business leaders too, like big time, especially big time salespeople who really understand how to sell, 
like these people are all high high sensitivity people like like presidents like so a huge percentage of them united states presidents are high sensitivity people because they can look at somebody they can and they can adjust on the fly how they're communicating to just really fine tune that in and 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 get it but at the same time you're right like it's also just the flood of it so so another way to describe it is just high perceptivity so so like just imagine that like you know you're just taking in like 30 percent more information in your environment at all times so anything that's loud is 30 percent louder anything that smells bad is 30 percent more bad smell anything that's itchy is 30 percent more itchy right like but also any tiny little nuanced detail is 30 percent bigger and you can see it when other people can't so so it's a huge amazing superhero level power if it doesn't completely destroy you and, and leave you in a puddle of 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 just kind of uh, a glass case of emotions um which is a chicago reference um, <laughs> I suppose the journey of parenting at that, that very point of time, right, is you have to teach them that it's not going to destroy you and it can be a superpower if you lean into it. Totally. And that's what it is. I mean, that's, that's fostering internal validation where, where your kids uh, don't believe that their worth is conditional on what they achieve or how they're perceived. I mean, if you can foster internal validation, any high sensitivity kid is going to be nine you know, ninety percent better out in the world when they're not constantly focused on how other people are perceiving them. Yeah, totally. And so, um, John, you speak a lot about like, um, like effective discipline. Like, what is effective discipline, and what's the difference between different children? You know, so some people obviously, like, I, I don't know if you've read the book um, Love Languages, um, something that I, I read, which talks about obviously just different people's um, what people appreciate, right, and how like how people like to be appreciated, and so. Does that come into mind when you're thinking about effective disciplining your child or your children? Um, so, somewhat. So, so I, de- I mean, this is just knowing your kid is the key to effective discipline, right? So, so knowing their love language is, is part of that. I think that for kids, um, their love languages aren't quite as like locked in and, and kind of, you know, nailed down as like a partner might be. Um, so, so definitely part of it. Uh, I would say that, you know, so, so I have to study ancient language. Like when I was in seminary, I had to study an- ancient languages. So, so I'm big into like linguistics. So when we look at the word discipline, the word discipline does not mean punishment, but this is how it's used interchangeably in, in most Western households. Like, oh, when I'm going to discipline my child, that's when I'm going to punish them. The word discipline literally comes from the same disciple. It means to teach, to be a learner, to be a teacher. And so when I, that's like the first thing I talk to parents about is like, okay, so how do you want to learn things? Do you want to learn things with a stick or do you want to learn things by sitting down and talking it through? You know, do you want me, when you're learning how to build your own website, every time you make a mistake, me hitting you on the back of the head with a stick, does that make it better or worse? Or, or does me sitting down next to you and clicking through it and going, okay, this is how we do this. Well, getting through complicated emotions or knowing how to be respectful to adults or, or knowing how to be a good friend or all of these things are kids that kids don't naturally inherently know how to do these things. We have to teach them. And there's two ways you can teach them. You can teach them in what I consider to be highly ineffective ways, which is just to kind of punish them for not getting it right. And it sends their brain, it literally shuts off the part of their brain the prefrontal cortex, every time you punish a kid or you scare a kid, I should say, anytime you scare a kid uh, by threatening punishment or whatever, you're just shutting off their prefrontal cortex, which is where they're making all the neural synapse connections to learn anything anyway. So, so, or you go to them and you go, Hey, what's going on here? You re-engage their neural cortex where they're, they're having to answer a question like, Oh yeah, what, why did I just take that toy away from my little brother? And, and just asking questions and making observations instead of coming down and commanding and demanding, this is this is a revolutionary shift for kids. I mean, just revolutionary. I mean, they just go, they pick up on things so much more quickly. You don't have to kind of do the same fights. I mean, you do sometimes for all of us. We don't automatically learn things and then just happen. But you don't go through the same kind of like beating your head against a wall I gave him a timeout for this exact thing every day for the last two weeks. Why isn't it working? Or I you gave him a spanking for this 
you know, for not getting on and do, you know, not coming off the park when he was supposed to. And then the next day he just did the same thing. Well, yeah, you shut, you shut their brain off and then you wondered why they didn't learn anything. So when we talk about effective discipline, it's just effective teaching and, and adults, dads, especially we, we, most of the time we're parenting, not how we are thoughtfully thinking through how to best teach something. We're just click run. How will we parent it? When I did this, what did my mom do? Yeah, command okay. C, command well, V, right? Copy paste. And, and and it's it's an ego thing, right? Hey, I turned out okay, therefore I should raise my kid the same way that I was raised. <laughs> Instead of saying, right, hey, maybe my kid isn't me. And maybe like just because I was able to process through things and make meaning out of my experiences doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best way to do something. I mean, people in our parents' generation also gave – um, liquid uh, or injected IV alcohol to stop Braxton Hicks contractions in the early 90s. Think about that. I mean, like this is what we were doing to pregnant women. We were saying, hey, you're having contractions. You're in preterm labor. We're just going to throw alcohol at you until the baby stops moving. I mean, this is what we did until like the wow. mid 90s. Okay. I did not know this. Yes, this explains so, so, a lot. So <laughs> Yeah, I got to ask my mom about this. I was, I was born in 1985, so I'm definitely within that. So, so but we don't, but we, when we talk about parenting, it's not different, right? We don't. Yeah. The the, the, the decade of the brain, or the, the the was was the 90s, right? This is when we learned. This is when we learned all about the brain. So anybody who was parented by people who are starting their parenting either in the early 90s or before, they didn't have access to this information. They had no idea, right? Hey, my kids stopped doing the thing that I didn't want them to do. It must have been because I I I hit them with a the bell. They didn't think. They didn't know that. You know, hey, actually. We can map somebody's brain, and, and this doesn't actually work. This is a terrible way to, to go about this. Yeah, sure, you, you do something over and over. Eventually, the kid will get the message, and I don't want to get hit. But most of the time, the kids, when you talk to kids, but I, I do. So when you talk to kids and you know you ask them, well, what, what's good? What's the best part of your day? What's the worst part of your day? And the kid comes back, worst part of the day, I got a spanking. He said, well, why would you get a spanking? I don't know. 90% of the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's yeah. true. Well, <laughs> is that teaching? Like, what, what are we teaching if they have no clue why they why they receive this punishment, you know? Sorry, sorry, Brett, I know you're going to chime in there. So I, I know for me, that I remember like being an older kid and when I understood I got hit. So for example, I would get hit because of I knew I was doing something bad, and my dad would my dad would obviously naturally punish me. My mom, I come from uh, my mom's Asian. My dad is um, European. He's British. So my mom would never hit me, but she, I mean, she'd emotionally torment me a little bit. That's a different story and probably a counseling session you and I need to probably have, but she used to, yeah, she used to pinch my ear and hold me up on my tiptoes and that really hurt. And, but, um, you know, when, when my dad got angry and, um, I love my dad absolutely dearly and he listens to these podcasts. So I have to be careful what I say now. I didn't realize he listened until recently and he called me up. He's like, yeah, you're bagging out me a little bit, son. <laughs> so, but, um, so some, you know, when I was older, I understood why I was, why I was getting hit and he, he gave me a hit. That was it. It was done and it was over. I understood why, um, I, what I did was wrong and that was it. What was worse when my, was when my parents, almost cold shouldered me for a long period of time. And I'm not I'm not saying long, I'm saying a few hours, but for me at an, at a young age that was that was torture, right? Um so can, maybe maybe we can touch about that a little bit. Like like the emotional degradation that you have like it's like let the child know uh, what they've done wrong at the moment in time. Don't just kind of stretch this pain out and make them let them work it out in their own head because they won't, right? That's right. No, that's totally that's totally correct. I mean, so so this is so, so, so as you know, the corporal punishment, let's call it of, so, so a lot of people don't know this. It, corporal punishment does not become popular in the United States really. And, and, and in the, in the wider Western world, there, there is an extent of this, but, but a lot of this comes from like a response of, of like the 1950s and sixties. It's it, it, like, when you think about people who are born in like eight, you know, 1918 and, and before in Western Europe, uh, probably Australia, I'm not sure, but the United States for sure, like they're not being punished in this way, right? So so anyway, when this kind of comes to an end, let's call it, it hasn't ended, it should end, but it hasn't ended. Um, but when it becomes somewhat taboo in the 90s, then what kind of became the age of the timeout? 
And this is this emotional, you know, essentially emotional abuse of, I don't want to, I don't like to call it that. Like, like I know that the parents are doing this. They think that this is the right thing to do, but, but this withholding of affection to try and have the same desired end. Right. But again, it gets down to the point of like, your kid doesn't actually know why they did what they did and what they were just disciplined for usually was reacting emotionally. So now the parents go, Hey, you reacted emotionally. And now I am going to void myself of all emotion to show you that this is how you should have reacted. And this is what kids draw. This is the cause and effect that kids draw. So what winds up happening is that kids just repress all of their feelings because they're like, these feelings are too big. I don't know how to deal with these things. I don't know how to get through this and process this. My brain has not yet been trained to go through the, what we call the sympathetic nerve cycle. So when some, when you, you know, when you almost get a car accident or something scares you, your body, your body floods with hormones, adrenaline, epinephrine, your sympathetic nervous system. Well, the natural thing to, to do is to calm it down with a sympathetic nervous system. Your body floods with the opposite hormones, totally chills you out. Your heart rate slows down. All of these things, your pupils uh, go from being dilated to, to smaller, right? Like you know, they constrict. So like all of these things happen when your asympathetic nervous system kicks in. Well, what parents do when they emotionally separate themselves is they the child's sympathetic nervous system kicks in, they get super amped and they're just like fight or flight. And then the parents walk away and the kid has no idea how to engage. They're, so so when, you, when you actually engage a kid when they're in that escalated state, their brain watches you, it mirrors you, you speak to them calmly, you talk them through, it's going to be okay, I'm right here. Their brain calms down and then their brain learns, this is how I do this. When I get escalated, I come back down. When I get escalated, I come back down. So we have an entire generation of kids who got escalated and had no idea how to come back down. Yeah, and, and, it, and, 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 and this, and this, like, this is a big deal. And the second part of this too, with the, with the specifically the, the, the isolation and putting kids away from you is that people don't think of it in this, in these terms, but we're all like evolved social apes, right? Like we were like in caves not that long ago in like the grand scheme of history. And the only reason that our species, the, the, the Homo sapiens survived, Homo ne the Neanderthals and Homo erectus, they could live basically on their own and be okay. The Homo sapiens only survived in groups. This is the only reason we survived. And so all of our ancestors had genetically coded into them, do not be alone, do not be alone, do not be alone, do not be alone. And now you've taken a young child of this species and you've separated it and its genetic coding just goes nuts because it's just like, I can't be alone, I can't be alone, I can't be alone, I'm vulnerable when I'm in this state. And so these are the two competing things. So that not only are they in fight or flight, they don't know how to come down, now you've given them a reason to be afraid. Even though it's a, a reason that we've evolved out of, it doesn't mean that our brain has adjusted yet. We're still about a million years before our brain catches up to that one. So, like, this is just, a, it's just a complicated thing, y'all. Like, I know that that's a lot of big kind of concepts, but like, it's really complicated. This child parenting thing is tough. And we don't know what the best, and everything I'm saying is in 20 years, somebody's going to go, yeah, but actually, if you had just done it this way, it would have been even better. And that's, that's so profound. Sorry, go, Brenda. Yeah. That's what it is. It, right? it, was, it was so good. It was so good. First of all, you still have me at the glass cage of emotion. I'm still like, I don't know if Ken got that one, but I was like, boom, nailed it. Got it. Um, that that was super, super profound. And you even gave us a y'all as well. There was one of them in there. I was like, very good. No, but that was super, super profound. Um, I'm going to start to bring it home. There's a few more questions. There's a two that we always ask. But the last one, really wrapping this up because you just gave through like so much, I guess, profound information um, and and really certain key points where I'm like, okay, I've never heard it explained like that. It makes a lot of sense now. There's reasons why I want to go and learn and and, um, and focus and, and, and I can definitely see that I'm going to be a better dad out of it. But for you, you're obviously extremely passionate about this. Why do you think that we need to, um, as men, as dads, learn these things instead of being the, well, I was brought up okay, and so everything, you know, I turned up okay. I was brought up like that, I turned up okay. 
Yeah, I mean, so so there's never been like the, the truth is there's never been a more difficult time in human history for any of us, like for for children, for teenagers, for men and women. Like, you know, I, I I'm not big on the whole like men are oppressed or anything like this. Like, I'm not I'm not going down that social like rabbit hole here. But but like the the rates of suicide in in, in men are outrageous. The rates of anxiety and depression among teenagers and especially male teenagers are outrageous. Um, like all of this stuff, we, we can't do it the way that it was done to us because the world was a different place then. And the world was just set up differently then. And because the world, because, you know, you could go outside and play football or whatever with the neighborhood kids for nine hours a day and be parented by five other people who weren't your parents throughout your, you know, your week. And, and you spent, you know, maybe, maybe 20 minutes on homework a night. And the rest of it was just hanging out with friends and doing social activities. And there wasn't this like constant demanding produce, produce thing that we've done in this, this kind of modern society that we have because of this, we have to be very keenly aware that our kids are growing up into a world that's going to be probably even more unimaginable for us. Um, like, and, and so we have to set up, set our kids up with the best possible available resources that they can have. You can't emotionally isolate your kid and expect them to be socialized somewhere else. They won't be. They're going to be socialized by the internet. If you're not raising your kids, somebody's raising your kids. And most likely it's an AI algorithm at this point. So, so. So, so understanding this and understanding that like you can't hand it off to grandma or the school system or the neighborhood moms or whatever, or your wife, like you can't hand these things off anymore. You got to be involved. And if you're not involved, you're going to watch your kids struggle for the rest of their life because you didn't set them up for that. And no, nobody wants that. So that's why we should care. Um, and it's just because our kids, we already don't recognize the world that we live in today. Our kids will, will grow up with an even greater exponential change and, and understanding that and understanding that we have to set them up for the best possible way. Um, I think, I think that's compelling. I think that no matter where you fall on the spectrum of parenting or politics or anything, you know, the world is changing more rapidly than you can fathom. And you know that it's not necessarily going to be easier. And so that's why this matters. That is so, that is so profound. I really appreciate you sharing that because uh, it's it's a great way to kind of circle back to what you first said at the start of this conversation, right? Uh, parenting or, and having children is probably the most impactful thing that we'll ever have in our lives. And if we don't get this thing, let's not say right, because I don't think there's ever a perfect or right way to parent. But uh, if you don't if you don't do the best things you possibly can to raise your your children the best possible way you believe, then you're going to watch them struggle for the rest of their life. And so it's your it's your job, really. It's our job, and um, to to impact these children in the right way. We in the best in the best ways we believe is the right way. And I think that's why. Um, again, you said earlier in this conversation that at no point in history we ever had access to this type of information, but now we do. You know, with the internet comes some amazing things, and obviously some terrible negative things as well. But with the amazing things, if we leverage that, we we lean into it once again. We can take a lot of great stuff, like listening to your TikTok channel, um, to listen to this podcast. Let's do a little bit of a a punt straight here, right? To jump into the yeah, to to your course when it's released. It's like awesome. These are amazing things that people would not have had access to even ten years ago, right? Let alone twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred, two hundred years ago. So I think. Um, with the with the change in the movement of society and um, the technology evolution, you know, hopefully we can mitigate some of the shit things that ca- that happen by all of the amazing things that you're doing and people like you are doing. And I just want to touch on that AI algorithm, right? I get targeted with ads. I don't know about you, Brendo, um, but I get targeted with ads with an AI um, avatar. It's like, and people are saying, my new best friend, they respond to me instantly. It's amazing. We have great conversations. It's an oh, really? AI. Yeah, it's like I mean, I've never downloaded it. Really? Yeah, it's crazy. You get targeted with that? You guys are a bit younger than me, so I'm probably not in their targeting space because they know that my 1985 brain will be like, nah, that's a little bit that's a little bit too ready, play, ready player one for me. <laughs> like I'm still trying to get into this like multiverse sort of stuff at the moment. 
Anyway, that's all good, but I love it. If you're not raising your kids, then somebody else is, and it's most likely an uh, computer-based AI. I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah. So, Ken, if you ever find the perfect parenting resource, please bring me back on the podcast and tell me. Yeah, I, I haven't found. I will say, just with what you said the last decade, probably the greatest parenting book ever written. I, that's my plug for it. Was written was published in 2014. Every other parenting book that I've ever read that's published after 2014, every single one references it. So just understand this is the revolutionary shift that like less than 10 years ago, there was a book published that now is cited by every other parenting book. Like this is what it is. Do you want to, do you want to give the plug to the parenting book? What is it? How do we get it? Oh yeah, sure. So anything written by Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson, but this one is called The Whole Brain Child. Um, the Whole Brain Child. The whole book. Who, who, um, one of our speakers actually brought that that book up. Um, I'll have to, I have to listen, re-listen to the episodes that we've listened to. Or actually, no, it was my, actually, my parent coach. My parent coach actually told me about that. Um, so Sarah, she actually came to my house and talked. We were doing our sleep, our sleep routine, and talking about, you know, the. Um, the controlled crying versus the emotional connection and obviously being there and being present. It's like, you have to do what's, what's best for you. We've tried, we tried, we didn't try the controlled crying because my wife couldn't handle that. Um, let's call it torture for her. Um, so we've, we've tried the whole, um, we settle and we place him in the cot. I then sleep on the floor next to him until he stopped holding my finger. And then I leave the room. And now that time is be- being contracted and contracted over time, but at least he knows that I'm there. And so she told me to check out that book, the whole brain child. So I really appreciate that. I'm definitely going to check it out. So, um, Brenda, I know we're gonna we're gonna close this off, Brenda. This is it. This is it. We're bringing it home. Sorry, John. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say. I was gonna say Ken, that's that's your that like the controlled crying. That's the thing that if you ask me about, everybody's gonna write in and be super mad at me. So yeah. good, good that we avoided that until the end. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All good. So final two questions that we always ask. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just waiting for all this. Don't, yeah, anyway, I'm not going to go down that one. <laughs> so the two questions that we always ask at the end, I'll ask the first one. So Ken and I first met in the fitness industry. I'm still very heavily involved in that fitness world. And obviously we hear about the dad bod that people uh, apparently can't avoid. So I want to know from your side, you've got three boys. How do you balance your life to still take care of your health and fitness? Whatever we pri- Whatever we truly value, we will prioritize. And, and, and if you don't truly value yourself, you won't prioritize yourself. Um, I know that I can't be a good parent if I don't take care of myself, period. I will become a worse and worse parent. And so I know how to check in with myself. I know how to have the people in my life that are important for me to, to check in with me so that I can at all times be kind of a high performer in everything. And that includes with my kids. Yep. Amazing. Sports or fitness wise, is there anything that like you just love to do? Um, so right to be completely honest, right now, running around with my kids is not like a little bit of fitness. Like, <laughs> like, like I have I have like a twenty pound weight vest on because it's my my eight month old. And I am and I'm running like hundreds of yards at a time. So I've lost more weight since having three kids. That's and amazing. Not that's actually, that. yeah, that's so actually that- amazing. It's like you've got like your rogue vest on, but it's actually your babies. And then it's like you've got your track team because the other ones are like six and seven or like at an older stage where you've actually got to run after them now. 100%. <laughs> so like, just think about like, does your, weight, does your weight vest encourage you as you run? Like my eight-month-old laughs as I run. That's like he's amazing. like... <laughs> <laughs> you, had, you had a little personal trainer in the making there, bro. So I, like, oh, I love it. Like we roughhouse all the time, so I mean, I work up a sweat every single day. Yeah, running after my kids. It. Also, I do play some recreational sports too. Um, right at this exact moment, my kids are not at an age where I can regularly. But yeah, I play volleyball and I played volleyball in, in college and stuff like that. Oh, awesome. nice, super. Cool. Nice. So this I is the question. You athlete, you guys never even asked me. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, this is the question that we ask everybody to bring it all bring it all home, right? And it's a little bit of a, a tricky question, so we hope we stop you here and obviously uh, force you to think a little bit. So, what is question? What is one question no one has ever asked you about? You know, it could be growing a business, growing a TikTok account, being a father, balancing time that you secretly wish someone had asked you. Oh, that is a good. So, one question that I wish somebody would have asked me. Um, people, people 
almost never ask me why I care what they do. Like what, like, why do I care how other people parent? Why don't I just keep it to myself? Right. This is, I wish somebody would ask. Well, let me be the first to ask you, why do you care about what other parents do as opposed to just keeping it to yourself? Okay. Um, well, I, I have an answer because I wish somebody would have asked me. Uh, my answer is because kids are full people too. They deserve all of the love and respect and um, benefits, societal benefits as adults do. And so I care because kids are vulnerable, but they are whole and complete people. And I, of course, I want to see parents thrive, but I really want to see kids thrive. I love that. That is such an amazing way to uh, to end this conversation. John, I reckon we can unpack a few more uh, hidden gems from you in a second episode, potentially in the future, so we'd love to have you on again. Um, so, Brenda, do you want to uh, close it off? I know you know the you know the real. John Fogel, it's amazing. Thank you very much. So you can find John on TikTok, which is where he's banging, which is whole parent. Also online, your courses. i got to ask, when are your courses going to be released? Do we have an ETA? So my wife is also an entrepreneur. She's working on, she's, she's created a photography course that is tr- incredible, amazing. Her business started before mine, so her course came out before mine. We are yes. focused on getting her course out, her course primed and figured out, and I'm using all that good information to create my course. So it's forthcoming. If you go on my TikTok, you click the link in the bio, and you get on my email list you will be the first to know and you will get a discount because you will be the first to know on that course when it drops. Boom, amazing. So make so sure good. you go and head that head over to TikTok, jump onto uh, John's uh, t- uh, sorry email subscription list. list that's whole parent with a W-H-O-L-E, not whole as in dig a hole because we're not creating holes in our parenting. We're creating the whole package of our parents, so W-H-O-L-E, parent. Okay, <laughs> love that. I love it. It's- and Instagram. Instagram is, is, is my big one right now. I do exclusive stuff on Instagram because I'm trying to grow over there because TikTok's a little inconsistent. Boom. Amazing. Bro, thank you so much for, ha- for, for, uh, for jumping on our podcast. It was an absolute pleasure. Uh, we thank really, really you. appreciate your time. So good. Thank you, John. See you next time. Bye. That's it from us on this episode on the DadBub Show. If you want to find out a little bit more about us, head on over to www.dadbub.com. Until next time, see you next week.